If you have your Bibles, turn with me to, with me to Matthew chapter 4. Uh, for our guest, we are walking through the book of Matthew. Uh, last week we stopped and we did our Thanksgiving meal. And by the way, we served over 300 folks in 25 minutes. And so you can thank the kitchen crew and all the volunteers for that. And uh, we celebrated early, but man, was it good. All right. Matthew 4, we'll be covering verses 12 through 22. And my title is Jesus, Jesus' Ministry Begins. Uh, we've been talking about John the Baptist. We were talking about John the Baptist being a forerunner of Christ. They were born six months apart. Their, their, their mothers knew each other, so they were around each other some growing up. But John the Baptist uh, was the first part of Matthew, and Matthew uh, you know, spoke of that, and we understood that John the Baptist was more of a, a country preacher. Okay, He was kind of the old school fire and brimstone. He'd have been a Bible thumper, yelling. Uh, guy. I, I grew up with preachers like that that went to our pulpit in Lawton, Oklahoma, where I was born. And they would start out with their coat on. And about a third of the way through, they'd take that coat off. And then some more, they'd roll up them sleeves. All right? Then they'd get their tie and go like this because you thought they were choking. All right? But I'm telling you, I learned so much from those guys of how important the Word of God is. Every word in the Bible means something. And so today I pray that you'll allow the Word of God to speak to you as we look at Jesus' ministry begins. I have three points today. Uh, number one, the right time and place. God is always on time. God always has a purpose for everything in your life. And John the Baptist uh, was in the first part uh, of Matthew. He was, he was the herald. He was the one introducing Jesus. But the time had changed. The time had changed, and Jesus was coming on to the scene. Number two, the light has dawned. When you look at the history of Israel, and you look at how for a while they would do good things, and they would follow God, and then they would mess up, and they would get in Babylonian captivity, or God would punish them because they were worshiping idols. So this is a new day. Folks, I am telling you, Jesus changes everything. When He came into this world, everything changed. At His birth, people don't understand, and there are people that don't believe in the virgin birth. But I'm telling you, God can do anything. And there was a purpose in a virgin birth. If Joseph was his biological father, he wouldn't have been the perfect son of God. And so we see purpose in Jesus' life even at birth. And number three, the call for fishers of men. Jesus couldn't do it by himself. I mean, he could, but again, the effectiveness of that was he taught them for three years and then He sent them out. He died on a cross. He went uh, you know, out of the grave on Easter Sunday. And so the disciples were the ones that had to pick up the mantle of Jesus Christ and carry the message of Christ around the world. So we see at the end of this sermon Him handpicking these disciples. And what an a, a honor and a privilege I'm sure that was for them. Verse 12, now when Jesus heard that John had been in prison, he departed uh, to Galilee. And again, Jesus kept kind of a low key at first. He had not chosen the disciples yet, but he wasn't wanting to go necessarily where John the Baptist was. And one of the reasons was uh, John the Baptist stirred up the scribes and the Pharisees. So his ministry kind of, and it didn't start there, but it was, uh, it, you know, before he got started, he had kind of gone down into Judea, and he realized that if he hung around Jerusalem, and remember, Jerusalem was huge, okay? It was a metropolitan area. The scribes and the Pharisees were there. John already had them fired up. 
And ever since Jesus left heaven, he was on God's timetable. Folks, I'm telling you, it is important that you stay on God's timetable. His timing is always right. And so Jesus started in Judea, but he realized that that was going to be dangerous, and it wasn't his time to go to Jerusalem. So he started a, a traveling, and he went north from Judea and went through Samaria, and he ended up back in his town of Nazareth. And even there, uh, the Scripture tells us, a prophet isn't known in his own town. I remember after I got saved and I surrendered to the ministry and did things, uh, three or four years went by and I run, to, run into an ex-schoolmate. And he asked me, Mike, what are you doing now? I'm a youth minister. He said, what? <laughs> and he had this goofy look on his face and I just laughed. I said, yeah. Uh, I said, Jesus changed my life. And so even when I go back to Lawton, I know people that knew me in college or high school, they'd look at me when I'm in a restaurant or something, and they'd say, hey, Taco, what are you doing? Because that was my nickname, all right? And the reason was I won a taco eating contest with the baseball players, okay? I ate 10 tacos in one setting, all right? My point is sometimes you have to understand that's the old me. I call it my B.C. days before Christ. And folks, I am telling you, Jesus came to save sinners like me. So he went up through Samaria, went to Nazareth, and then, verse 13, and leaving Nazareth, uh, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. And again, the reason John was in prison was because he's called out King Herod. King Herod was committing adultery, and he called him out, and he put him in prison, and later had him beheaded. Okay? So Jesus saw the danger there and why he went up. And folks, everything is about God's timing. About God's timing. Galatians chapter 4, look over there. Hold your finger where we're at. Galatians 4.4, 4. but when the fullness of time had come, what well, God is, contr it is in control of time, folks. He knows the right time for Jesus to come. 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was silence. But I'm telling you, Matthew uh, brought out his gospel and Jesus came to earth when God said it was time. And it says, and God sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law. The law was, was everything in the Old Testament and everything to the Jew to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Jesus wanted to adopt a men and women unto his family. And we call that salvation. It is when you repent of your sins and you invite Jesus to come into your life and you make Jesus Lord of your life. So this was the beginning of his public ministry. His birth was special. The timing of the 30 years of raising was special. And even these three years of ministry began right there in in, in Capernaum. And Capernaum was the capital city. And if you were looking on a map, uh, you could see the Sea of Galilee. And you will notice that a lot of the things that happened in the New Testament and in the Gospels were around the Sea of Galilee. That's where six of the twelve uh, uh, disciples were called. They were called from Capernaum and, and there. And you have to understand, Capernaum basically... Uh, means comfort, okay? Jesus come, came to comfort the brokenhearted. Oh, folks, in our, in our society right now, there are so many people that are hurting. There are so many people that are broken. But I am telling you, Jesus can change your life. And so he started ministering on the Sea of Galilee around Capernaum, 
And then they give even more description there, Zebulun and Naphtali. That was where when the 12 tribes came in, these two tribes settled on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And he is just giving us a map and trying to let us know the area. All right, when you look at the area to the west and to the north, it's around 30 miles by 60 miles. All right, 30 miles wide and 60 miles up and down. And so you see Jesus went about in a relatively small area. But one of the reasons is they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have computers. Everything said and done was word of mouth or by a messenger. But Jesus ministered first in Capernaum. And he was doing exactly what his father was telling him to do. Look at John chapter 10. Look with me at John 10. John 10, verse 17. This is Jesus' words. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. And it's just telling you that Jesus wanted to die on the cross for you. Matter of fact, he went all the way to the north, and if you look at the Gospels to the end of the Gospels, his whole track after that was going south and going down into Jerusalem to die. Folks, he came to die for us. And then it says, uh, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. He was doing what his Father asked him to do. Folks, we need to obey our Heavenly Father. Sometimes it may not be logical what He asks us to do, but there is a reason and a purpose for everything uh, God asks us to do. Look at Luke. There's a, a better description in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Look at verse 14. Luke 4, verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Okay, this was Dr. Luke who wrote the book of Luke, and he normally has more details than the other Gospels. And news of him went out through all the surrounding region, which means he started teaching there, and it was on a, a, a scale, a, a kind of a quiet scale. It was just it, it was just meeting places. It could be in someone's house or, or things like that. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And again, we're going to talk about the synagogues next week, but it's simply he went to that because that's where the Jewish people hang, hung out. All right, He wanted to uh, talk to the Jews first, and then later on he also ministered to Gentiles. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up and read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And that was one of the things they did. They would take part of the Old Testament and someone would read that aloud. And when he had opened the book, he found a place where it was written and he is quoting from the Old Testament. This is a uh, Old Testament prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, talking about Jesus, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and to recover the sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are pressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And you know what is amazing about the Bible? That Isaiah was written 800 years before Jesus came on the scene. But that's exactly what Jesus did. This was Jesus' ministry. Now look at verse 20. And then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. They were saying, who is this guy? There's something different about this guy. And folks, I'm telling you, if you're around people long enough, you can sense the Holy Spirit inside of people. And I'm telling these folks, it, they were amazed at the reading of the Word. And He began to say to them, Today, 
This scripture is, scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What was he telling them? I am he. I am Jesus. I am the Messiah. Could you imagine being there that day? I mean, Jesus himself started his ministry reading from the prophetic book of Isaiah, and he was talking about himself. Now look at verse 22. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, Is this not Joseph's son? They were saying, He's a carpenter. He's a son of Joseph. He hasn't been to the schools, the rabbi schools. He hasn't studied in the Jewish synagogues. Who is this guy? And I can tell you in one word who it is. It is Jesus. Oh, folks, we need to eat, drink, sleep, think, pray about Jesus, folks. He's everything to us. He changed 12 men. All right, he changed uh, just the, the way people look at Scripture. He changed so much. So Jesus, when he started his ministry, was at the right place at the right time. Second thing I want you to see, that the light had dawned. Look back in our text. The light had dawned. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet said, in this part of Isaiah is Isaiah 9, Verses 1 and 2, in the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali, uh, by way of the sea and beyond the Jordan, Galilee of Gentiles. Okay? And again, when you look at Samaria, Samaria and you look at where these were, that was where uh, uh, Gentiles, and, and some of them called Samaritans, they were even called half-breeds in those days. And they were outcast by the Jew. If you were a Jew and you were walking on one side of the of, 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 of road and you saw one coming, okay, a Gentile, they would literally cross the street so they would not have any contact with you. Okay? You weren't welcome in their houses. You weren't welcome in their synagogues. There was just this, this you know, this stigma of, of Jews between Gentiles. And again, you know, some of the, you know, you, you call them what you want. Uh, some people call them holy rollers. Okay? Folks, we are, I mean, we Christians, we should not be high minded. We should not act like we're better than someone else. Folks, when you look at the, 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 the disciples, they were fishermen. Okay? And I'll, I'll speak of that just in a minute. Verse 16, and the people set in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus was that light. Oh, folks, I can't tell you how important light is to living. We can't have plants without light. We can't see without light. And the spiritual connotation here is Jesus is that light. They lived in darkness for 400 years. Even before that, they were slaves in Babylon and and they were under the yoke of bondage because of their choices. But Jesus came to show that light. And upon whose set in the region, in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Oh, folks, Jesus is our only hope. Jesus is everything to us. And that's what He is saying in this Scripture. Matter of fact, he says it in Isaiah chapter 42. Go with me to Isaiah 42, if you would. And this, is, it, this is literally Israel coming out of Babylonian captivity, but he also, and that's the Old Testament, he compares that to Jesus beginning his ministry. Behold my servant whom I uphold. Notice the capital M, capital S. That's deity. When you see capital words, uh, talking about Jesus, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. You know what? God, looking at his son Jesus, was so proud of his son. I mean, he sent him to earth. He had a job to do, and Jesus did it well. And it says, I have put my spirit upon him. 
and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. See, they were, they were just second-class citizens to everyone else. But you know, Jesus treated everyone the same. Folks, I don't care the color of your skin. I don't care where you come from, what you have on, piercings, uh, tattoos, all right? It matters none. That is a personal choice. Jesus died for all. And we as a church, and we do as a church, welcome all nations, all people into the fellowship of our services. Verse 2, he will not cry out nor raise his voice. See, John the Baptist did that. He let John do the yelling, all right? And it says, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. Man tried to break him. Pilate tried to break him. The soldiers that beat him tried to break him. But he would not break. People said bad things about him. People lied on him in the court of law. But he took it all for you and I. And smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And in the coastland shall wait for his law. Thus saith the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth that which it comes from, who gives breath to people who walk in it. Folks, I am telling you, the reason you got up this morning was because of God and Jesus Christ. God gives you the breath that you have inside of you and the Spirit to those who walk on it. And the Lord have called you in righteousness and, and will hold your hand, will keep you and give you as a covenant people as a light unto the Gentiles. Well, folks, that's what Jesus was doing. He started it up in Gentile country. Yes, there was Jewish synagogues. Yes, there were Jews around there. But I'm telling you, he went, and you'll see this next week, the first thing he did when he went to a town, he went into the Jewish synagogue and he preached the gospel. But then, when he was doing what I call street ministry, he was ministering to the Gentiles. So we see the right time. We see the right place. And the last thing I want you to see, uh, uh, the light dawn, the call of fisher of men. Look at verse 18. Well, wait a minute. I, I skipped 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, <coughs> excuse me, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that word repent, it's so important John the Baptist said the same thing. Repent. And folks, repent literally means a change of mind. Okay? Repent means I was heading in a direction and I stopped. God stops me in my track. Jesus calls out my name. I invite Jesus to come into my life and I turn around and I go a different direction. I'm going towards Jesus. I'm going towards church. I'm going towards the Word of God. I'm going to please God. And this thing that is going on right now is all you have to do is believe. Folks, I got one question. What does this Scripture say? Even the devil believes and trembles. Belief is something in your head. You invite Jesus into your heart after you repent of your sins. So Jesus is just coming behind, behind John, or John just laid, laid the, the, the plan right there. All right? Repent for the kingdom of... Folks, I'm telling you, Jesus is coming again. You look at what's going on in Israel. You look at the countries that are lining up against Israel. You look at what's going on in the world and the currency and the the bitcoins and all these things, they already have uh, places and businesses where if you are part of that business, they don't take cash anymore. Okay? What they do is they put a little chip in your wrist, and if you go for a break to the cafeteria, you just wave that over that. 
Folks, I am telling you, I am not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying, if you look at all that, it is setting up for the Antichrist. All right? And so we need to understand that the same thing Jesus said 2,000 years ago is true today. Unless you repent, you will not see heaven. So John said it first. Jesus comes around and says it again. And then he starts looking for some men to help him. Look at verse 18. And Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brothers, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And like I said, six or seven of the disciples were fishermen, so they knew what fishing was about. They were, they were crusty guys, okay? These guys weren't People, you, you bring them to dinner and meet your parents, you're just praying they don't say something goofy or say something. All right? They're used to being outdoor. Sometimes their language was not good. Okay? I mean, you know, but there were some good qualities of fishermen also. Fishermen had to be patient. Okay? And, and that's one reason I have trouble fishing. To sit there and look at a cork for two hours. Okay? I'm ADD anyway, so I get another reel, and I'm reeling while I watch the cork. But fishermen, I mean, you, you think Jesus could have got any, he could have got rabbis, he got, could have got Jewish leaders, but he, I mean, John the Baptist already kind of, uh, you know, uh, made everybody realize that that's not the kind of people that Jesus was looking for, okay? But folks, I am telling you, these 12 men helped Jesus set the earth on fire with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you think about what happened on the day of Pentecost, this is the same Peter, okay? The same Peter. And then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And folks, when it says follow Jesus, another word for Christians are believers Another word, Christians, is followers. And Jesus, boy, he was very uh, adamant about, you know, what the importance is of following Jesus. It's not a cakewalk. It's not a game. It's not something you do just for a little while. He was serious. Luke 14, look at this. Luke 14, verse 26. Luke 14, 26. This is Jesus' word. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and sisters and brothers, yes, his own life. I'm sure some of the disciples were sitting there thinking, I'm supposed to hate my mom? Well, no, that's not what he's saying. He's saying you need to be totally committed to Jesus Christ. You need to surrender everything to Jesus Christ. Folks, being a Christian, if they told you that was easy, Somebody lied to you. It's a challenge. It takes work. It takes discipline in your life. And so Jesus set the bar high. And look what he says. He cannot be my disciples. So Jesus, and my whole point is, saw in these men something that we would not have seen. We would have thought, they're fishermen. What do they know? They're not educated. They're not trained. They're, you know, rough and tough. And, you know, how are they going to make good disciples? Well, I'll tell you here in just a minute. Look at verse 20. They immediately left their nets and followed them. <laughs> Can you imagine me working one day and Jesus comes by your work and simply says, you need to follow me. Are you going to leave your work? Are you going to walk away from your work, your vocation, your income, and not only that, your family? Your family. Look, look, look at verse 21. On from there, he said, he saw two brothers, James, John, John and other brother James, the son of Zebedee, John's his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Folks, it's a serious deal to be a disciple of Christ. 
It's a serious call to be a Christian. And that's what, that's what we need to understand. When we share the gospel with others, you don't know who that person could become. Somebody had to share the gospel with Billy Grant. Somebody had to share the gospel with J. Harold Smith. And so when we share the gospel with others, I'm telling you, God could use us to further His ministry further than we ever thought we would do or could do. So He had a purpose in calling these fishermen. Jesus was saying, I can't do it by myself, and, and I can do it by myself, but it'll be more effective because I'm going to invest three years into y'all and then I'm going back to my father's house. And these men picked up the mantle and he said he called them to be fishers of men. They knew how to catch fish, but they didn't know how to catch men. And folks, I am telling you, the Word of God tells us how to share the Gospel. The most important thing in any New Testament church is sharing the gospel with others. Folks, every time we see somebody baptized, somebody shared the gospel with them. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, go with me. 1 Peter 2. Look at verse uh, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We can do that, folks. We are the light also. Jesus, put, Jesus puts His light in us, and we can share that light with others who, were, who once were not, uh, not a people, but now they're the people of God who had obtained mercy, who had not obtained mercy, but now they have obtained mercy mercy. Luke chapter 10. Luke 10. And these, these, are, these are Jesus' words. 10 verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two by two before His face to every city and place. And He Himself was about to go. Then He said, this is Jesus. The harvest is truly great, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest, to send out labors into His harvest. Oh, folks, everyone you meet is a prospect. Everyone you meet, you don't know who knows Christ and who doesn't. And that's what He's saying. I am telling you, folks, we live in a dark world. We live in darkness is around us. Crime, hate, Murder, all these things, folks. It's darkness. And we need to be sharing the gospel with Christ with others. And the last scripture, Acts 4, and I'm finished. Acts chapter 4. This one always gets me. I love this. On the day of Pentecost, you, you knew what happened. 3,000 people got saved. Well, Peter and John got arrested. All right, for sharing the gospel. But look down here in verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. Just like people marveled when Jesus got up and just read a passage. They marveled. They realized that they had been with Jesus. Oh, folks, let me ask you a question and I'm through. Can people tell you have been with Jesus? Oh, folks, there's a lost and dying world out there, and we need to tell them about Jesus. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the greatest decision you can make today is coming to Jesus Christ. Our ministers will be standing here, and we will help you in any way we can. We can share Scripture with you and we can tell you about Jesus, but you have to take that first step. If you're here today and you, you may need to rededicate your life to Christ, 
Okay, maybe you hadn't been living for the Lord like you should. But the Holy Spirit today speaks to you and says, Yes, I know I'm a Christian. Yes, I know when I die I'm going to heaven. But I need to be following Jesus Christ more intently. Or maybe you have been saved and need to be baptized. We would love to be the church that baptizes you. Or even you're here today and want to join the church. Just come and talk to us, and we can show you how to do that. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for your your example. And God, thank you for your ministry. God, you showed ministry. You called fishermen, simple men of God. And God, they turned their world upside down for you. So God, I believe that if we're truly going to be the lighthouse on the south side of Fort Smith, We need to be sharing the gospel with others. God, we can't mess that up. Your word is true. It is yes. It is amen. And God, I pray that you would give us labors for the harvest. God, I pray that we'd be inviting people to church and we'd be praying over people and we would tell and testify of what you've done in our lives. God, we can make a difference because you are in us. The Holy Spirit tells us what to say. So God, I pray that we would make a commitment, even if we don't come forward, we would make a commitment to live closer to you. God, this is your church. This is your time. This is your invitation. You do with it what you choose. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet, and if God has talked to you in any way, would you come?